Maybe it's all just not working. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Oh, yep. okay. I had very messed up, sorry. I had very messed up um, audio settings. That's all right, how are you doing? Good, I have a question that I realized I should have established earlier on. Um, I use Keynote and I- <laughs> We've just gone through that with, with Laura, <laughs> Um So I've heard, I've had a bad experience before trying to use presenter view and Keynote, you know? Let's, um, let's give it a try and you're gonna speak first. So if we can get it working, we'll just leave your slides up. Yeah. Okay, yay. Um, I wonder if I, okay, let, I'll just try to show the whole desktop rather than the keynote view. Ba -na -na. So here it is, right, right. And now I hit play. What happens? It looks good. Uh, it looks, it's just your first slide. Uh, if you have movies, do you want to go to those? Yep. Movies. Ooh, oh, did I do a bad job of positioning my title? That's okay. That shouldn't get, I don't think that'll get knocked out. Um, okay, that's good. Fine. I remember, I remember months ago reading Adam's email um, about placing things on the slide and then I didn't think of it. It's just you, on YouTube, your face will be in the upper right corner. Yeah. Upper right. I think upper right is safe to ignore. Yeah, it's only a small bit of the slide. I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, we can see your mouse, which is good. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was going to ask that. Okay. Okay. So should I just leave this? Yeah, you can leave it. We'll get started in just like a minute or two. That's perfect. Thanks. Yay, I did it. <laughs> We're very, very proud of ourselves when we get to- I got this far. I got this far. I really want to stand. I don't know if I can do it though. If I stand, it's like- We can just watch your stomach while you speak. My, my stomach, yeah. It's really hot here today. Oh, Jennifer, you know that. Yeah, it's <laughs> gross. I was telling them that I went outside and it was like a wall of hot water that I- really gross, yeah. Into me. And you don't have AC either? I have a, a window unit, but it's pretty feeble. Oh man, guys, like this is one of the very best parts about living in the modern era is air conditioning. <laughs> so true, so true. All right, um, and Adam, okay. I'll, yeah. I'll leave it up to you. Yep, I'll get started now, perfect. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to another week with some motivation seminars. We've got two speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Tim Pesenden, who is a postdoc in Stefani Sprangler's lab at MIT. He works on the intersection of cell motility and tumor immunology. His doctoral work with Margaret Gardell uh, focused on tissue shape, shape changes and collective cell motility in 3D. Uh, outside the lab, Tim serves on the committee for postdocs and students within the ASCB and has produced several podcasts with Glimpse. And today he's going to be talking about how tissues change shape and then some immunology. All right, you. Um, I think I lost my mouse, but maybe it'll reappear. We'll find out. Um, so thanks everyone for um, tuning in. And actually I want to give a special thanks to um, Jennifer Mitchell because she, you were really nice to me after I was rather publicly frustrated on Twitter. Um, and it led to a really nice exchange. So um, you didn't have to be so nice. And I really, uh, I won't forget that. Okay, so um, I'm going to breeze through the work I did in Margaret's lab um, at Chicago. And then I'll hopefully with some time at the end, I'll um, update everyone on what I'm doing in immunology. <clears throat> okay, so oh, there's my mouse. All right, so my PhD was primarily concerned with how tissues change shape. Um, and I was really agnostic about whether that shape change was accomplishing a developmental goal, such as you can see in this movie, which is um, from the mouse mammary epithelium explant, um, forming kind of a branch structure for the um, mammary gland, or whether that was for um, the end of tumor invasion. So last week we heard from Ming Guo, and this is a, a video that he showed us that I think really nicely encapsulated kind of the dynamics that I was interested, as is he, 
um, during which a chunk of tumor cells, or in this case, immortalized cells, can um, display a lot of the hallmarks of invading tumors. Um, but our question was really, how do individual cells, what, what role do individual cells play and how do they change their behaviors, especially how they adhere to each other and then also how they adhere to the matrix during these shape changes. Um, so I wanna convince everyone that MDCK asini are a really great model to explore this. Um, they're an immortalized cell line, they're very tractable. Um, they form these beautiful polarized spheroids in 3D. And here I'm showing you um, just a zoom through of one of those spheroids that I cultured. So you can see the actin nicely in cyan and the nuclei are in magenta. Um, they form these really beautiful structures fairly easily. They maintain that state for a fairly long time. Um, they're polarized. They have all these hallmarks of cell polarity and they're equally happy as um, uh, cells in 2D or in 3D, which makes them really uh, flexible, which will be really cru crucial to the data I'll show you. Um, so how about the, the, the tissue shape change part of what they do? Well, it's been known for a long time now that um, if they're plated, if these spheroids are plated inside collagen gel matrices and then treated with a single growth factor, that's HGF here, they undertake this um, very uh, well-described um, tubule genesis program. So I'll show you a movie of that here. So um, I'm showing you only the beginning stages of that. This is about 12 hours of imaging, but you can appreciate how individual cells begin to protrude out from the spheroid and migrate out. And eventually they'll form multicellular chains and eventually tubules. So, what I'm going to show you uh, today are um, the, the methods are encapsulated here. So um, for every experiment, I started in actually in Metagel, which is a basement membrane um, reconstituted kind of prep. They grow in Metagel. I would then isolate them intact and then replate them into collagen gels because it's only in collagen that they will undertake this branching morphogenesis program. So this is what it looked like in my hands um, for just for actin stain. So here you see um, an acinus uh, or a spheroid um, actin before and then following um, HGF addition. And HGF is kind of convenient for these kinds of questions because it actually acts um, through the MET receptor you can see on the right. And the MET receptor can activate both RAC and RO. So we have all of our favorite players already involved, um, producing ARP23 generated um, branched actin filaments uh, networks, and then Rho um, activating formins and myosin to produce um, contractile bundles of actin. So our question is really, how are these two different architectures of actin involved at a single scale level to help this tissue accomplish this shape change? So, um, that's kind of summarized here, um, which I found to be a really interesting question. I found really no answers in the literature that really satisfied, um, could satisfactorily encapsulate this process. Um, so the first thing I did, um, as you do, is you throw some inhibitors at these uh, little steroids. Um, so here I'm showing you in the absence of HGF, um, steroids cultured with the ARP2-3 inhibitor or a panformin inhibitor. Um, that's how they look there. And then following um, 48 hours of HGF, we were very surprised to find that ARP23 inhibition apparently had no effect on um, the ability of cells to branch out into the collagen matrix. They certainly didn't look normal, but they were capable. Whereas formin inhibition um, actually completely ablated this response, although the cells by my metrics did not really appear that abnormal. So this is a really cool, really fun. It was absolutely one of those aha moments or not even aha, it was like one of those that's very weird moments um, with me and Margaret when I first showed her these results. Um, so I'm not gonna show you, but I did produce stable cell lines in which the formin family members, dia one, dia two and FHUD1 were all knocked down. I did a little bit of work with the latter two, but what I'm gonna show you today is dia one knockdown.
So the first thing we wanted to ask was, is there some basic motility defect that these cells are just completely incapable of, of, of doing anything at all if you knock down dia one? Um, so we did, we took advantage of the very convenient fact, again, that MDCK cells can be easily cultured in 2D or in 3D. And um, we did just a simple scattering assay. And the, the, what to me is a really cool thing about this kind of assay is that I use HGF at the exactly same concentration in this assay on a cover slip as I do in the 3D culture system to accomplish branching morphogenesis. Except here in 2D, we have scattering, a typical scattering response. That scattering response was not prevented um, in the knockdown cells. So that didn't seem to be a problem. Um, next, we looked at another case of motility. And this has been something actually that a lot of people in the seminar series have presented, I'm happy to say. Um, which is the observation that um, in 3D, these cells actually do not remain immobile inside of their spheroids. Um, they actually, and early on after the addition of HGF, as I'm showing you here, um, there's a lot of cell rearrangement and especially asinar rotation. So the whole spheroid will rotate. Um, however, that was not really affected as we could measure by the knockdown of dia one. So, these cells were still able to do these cool, weird looking rearrangements. Um, I found it really cool, but we, it wasn't really the point of the, our work to actually explain these completely. Um, but dia one seemed to be kind of not required for that motility. So what we concluded and what I would like to convince you of is that we can group these kinds of motility on the glass cover slip or here as I'm showing you inside of the three-dimensional spheroid as planar. So these cells that you're seeing now are kind of in one plane, that plane just happens to be folded up into a sphere, right? So um, we can group these as planar motility for which dia one is not required. Looking back then at just a simple transmitted light image, um, following HGF addition, the thing that we noticed about dia one was it, the cells could protrude, they could make these little tiny protrusions, but none of those were stable and they would always just disappear. And so this led, um, this led us to, uh, I did a set of measurements that I'm not going to show you to kind of establish this formally, but we thought that this really was pointing at a, an adhesion defect to the collagen specifically. Um, so that, that would prevent the knockdown, the knockdown cells from being able to do this invasion. So we, look, we wanted to look a little more carefully then at adhesions. And I was in a great lab to do that because Patrick Oakes, um, a former postdoc in the lab, had published a paper and other people have published very similar papers on a strong requirement for cells for uh, dia one or other formins and myosin in uh, a process called focal adhesion maturation. So in this um, schema shown here um, at the top, you have the lamellocodia where the cell is protruding and there is their formation of many but very unstable nascent adhesions. And then it is only upon the transition to the lamella farther back, where you have requirement for um, formins to polymerize actin at that site and myosin can come in. And that is a critical part of the focal adhesion maturation process. And it's something that's been studied in a lot of contexts, but there isn't a super strong set of sort of physiological requirements that we can all know about and recite for what focal adhesion maturation is required for. We know it's involved in stability though. So this led us to hypothesize that perhaps this planar motility was dia one independent and was therefore um, required, uh, did not require focal adhesion maturation. Whereas the dia one dependent adhesions to the collagen maybe did. So we wanted to test that. And um, what we turned to was fluorescent labeling of collagen to see if we could watch how the cells interacted with the collagen gel. So I'm showing you here a transmitted light and then a fluorescence image. And what you can see is in two spots, 
the collagen gel being deformed by uh, the cells. And you can kind of match up with your eye exactly the points where the cells are reaching out and touching the collagen and grabbing onto it and deforming it at those points. And this, again, I have to point out, this actually dovetails very nicely with last week's talks, talk by Ming Guo. <laughs> So um, meanwhile, when we looked at the knockdown um, spheroids, we saw many fewer the localized deformations of collagen. So we wanted to um, explore this in a little more mechanistic depth. And so we called upon our favorite players, um, actin, which we're labeling here with life act, and then myosin light chain, which marks active myosin. And we could see indeed if we just focus on the leading edge of one of these um, uh, invading um, strings of cells, we can match the collagen deformation, if you look down here, with um, adhesion to the collagen, sorry, it's the collagen deformation with recruitment of myosin and enrichment of actin. So it's the system is kind of behaving mostly as we would expect. Um, that indicates this, the, the presence of strong and stable adhesions that can actually allow the cell to do this pulling, right? Um, especially the recruitment of myosin. Um, that recruitment of myosin was a little bit uh, curious to us because it seemed to be so close to the leading edge. And in my mind, I didn't think of myosin as being really right at the leading edge of a migrating cell. Um, but we had such nice live imaging with myosin light chain. I, I wanted to really show where it was in relation to adhesions. So I'm, I'm not showing everything here, but um, I use the phosphotyrosines, um, which is uh, an antibody that can mark all mature adhesions, it's thought. Um, so many, many uh, mature adhesions have phosph phosphorylated tyrosine residues in them. And I was really struck to find how closely associated the myosin was with phosphotyrosine here. Although if you can see the leading edge of this cell here um, is relatively free of myosin. Um, so we thought maybe myosin is a good marker. Um, we could even see, this isn't a movie, this is just three stills of the leading edge. Um, we could even see some evidence for stress fibers. This wasn't in the paper, but um, if you look at the cyan channel, which shows actin, you can see some linear um, arrangements of um, the actin. See, I'm doing it because I lose my, oh man, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to point, but my point like to disappear. That's okay. So um, this was one thing that didn't go into the paper, but it convinced me looking at it um, that there was evidence for actual stress fibers being involved. Um, at the leading edge and those being coordinated with myosin. So how do we more quantitatively measure all this stuff? Because nothing I've shown you in the past few slides is actually really a rigorous measurement of like, okay, collagen deformation. I'm not mean Guo. I'm not going to try to model the mechanical properties of a collagen gel to try to back out forces or anything. Um, but when I was uh, reading a ton about MDCK cells and their culture, um, I came across this really interesting fact that the first paper that used, well, many papers, but certainly the first paper that published um, tubular genesis of MDCK cells did it both embedded, as I've been showing you in this whole talk, but also by culturing cells simply on top in a monolayer on top of a collagen gel. Um, so this gave me the confidence that maybe these cells would be pretty happy on top of a collagen gel, and indeed they are, and it works really well as um, combined with the fluorescent label blowing of collagen that I had um, started doing. So here you can see actin and collagen of a migrating MDCK cell. So we use this to our advantage because now we had a way of maybe um, accessing um, the interactions between these cells and the collagen matrix in a way that was really not possible with a 3D culture. So we took a page out of traction force microscopy, which, ho which hopefully people here are familiar with, um, in which we can culture cells on a collagen matrix and then um, blow off the cells using a detergent, allow the collagen to relax, and then take images. So that's what I'm showing you here. This is the control case. Oh, here's now they have my mouse. I'm not going to let it go. Okay. 
Um, here's a control case where you can see this really strong deformation, uh, well, a deformation, I guess, of collagen. Um, I compared this to the knockdown case. So uh, it just merged the on and the off channels. Um, and it's not that there's no deformation in the case of the dial and knockdown, but when we did um, measurements of the actual, the total amount of deformation normalized to area, we found that was much greater in the case of the control cells versus the dial and knockdown cells. So this is not, um, here on the left, I'm showing you a displacement feature that is not, uh, does not inform us about the mechanics of the collagen gel because we weren't comfortable trying to make those, trying to basically model that. Um, but it was a strong uh, phenotype. And we also coupled that with canonical polyacrylamide gel traction force microscopy, which also showed the same difference. Um, so all these things lead us to a strong requirement for strong mechanics um, to pull on the collagen gel um, mediated by dial one. And all of that requiring a really strong adhesion, which we think the dial one cells don't have. Um, so, what we propose at the, the close of this paper is that um, the, that we're seeing a really a physiological role for focal adhesion maturation in order to stabilize these adhesions. Um, and that, that could provide actually a switch from sort of dia one independent motility, which doesn't require super stable adhesions from dia one dependent motility. I mean, you could also say I mean, I also did some experiments with focal adhesion kinase, which is another very important focal adhesion um, stability um, protein. So you could call these maybe fact-dependent, fact-independent. Um, in our case, we were really concerned with actin architecture. And so what we came away with was this binary view of adhesions and what kind of adhesions you build. And then how do you move as a tissue through a three-dimensional matrix? So um, there was some really interesting other observations that were included, some were not included in the paper, but um, going back to the, a really stringent requirement for stable adhesions, why would you need that? You would need that, especially if your entire spheroid is moving and you're the one cell who reached out and grabbed onto some collagen. So that's the case here in this movie. Um, it's a little bit hard to pick out, but the whole organoid is moving, is rotating up. So it's rotating from the bottom of the screen to the top of the screen. And this one little cell is reaching out and grabbing on, right? And then it has to kind of hang on as all these cells sort of stream past it. Um, we saw an, sort of an opposite case also of that here I'm showing on the right in which um, it appeared that the sites of adhesion that we can see by mice and light chain were actually shared between adjacent cells. So this cell, which has strong life fact um, expression is followed by a cell that has weaker life fact expression, so you can tell they're different cells. But this following cell reforms adhesions in the exact same spot as a cell in front of it. So that was really cool and really unexpected. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to um, Genalia and um, access their um, lattice light sheet microscope there. And this made this, this case more even um, better with much better signal to noise ratio imaging. Um, and here I'm showing you in red actin, or sorry, life act, and in white collagen, where you can see that this cell is trying to move and it's dragging this one adhesion behind it. And as it does that, it buckles a lot of the collagen. And I mean, it tenses some collagen fibrils and buckles others as it's kind of like stuck to this one spot. Um, hey, Tim. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we're running up on your time here. So just- um, Thank you. you. Know. Just about one minute left. Great. Um, so I'll um, skip ahead a little bit to um, just show you an introduction um, of what I'm doing now. Um, so because I don't want to lose out the immunology for all the immunology lovers. Um, <laughs> So I joined Stephanie Spanger's lab here at MIT, and um, what we're really interested in is understanding dendritic cells, so critical cells for the immune system, and how their behavior changes inside of tumors. Um, so we do this a lot of different ways, but we're interested first on um, short time scales, like I'm showing you in this movie here, and we know that this has some correlations with um, the immune system's ability to fight tumors. 
We can also do it on longer time scales. Um, we can do this a couple different ways, um, but namely with photo conversion. So we can um, ask questions about dendritic cell photo sort of systemic redistribution over days. Um, so these rely on um, intravital imaging, which I've um, taken up. And um, we can transplant entire tumors from mice in which um, one lineage is expressing a fluorescent protein and then another lineage is, is expressing a different protein. Um, and we are also doing ex vivo culture, so sort of organoid culture from tumors um, in which we can mod um, observe the motility of uh, dendritic cells. So this is a very brief overview of what I'm doing these days, um, and I hope to have more for everyone soon. Um, so I'm going to actually zoom back up to here to thank the people who were involved in most of the work that I showed today. So this is Margaret's lab at the time that I left. The work that I discussed was published in 2018 in JCB. Um, but I don't want to forget my current my current lab mates are great. I'm here with Stephanie Springer, and um, things are things are also really moving along here. Okay, sorry, I had to, had to quickly finish there. Uh, I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Tim. Thanks a lot. Sorry, um, it's hard to fit the two talks into to one hour. Um, we're just going to do um, one question, and then we're going to move on to Laura. Sorry about that. Um, oh, that's fine. So Malika is asking, um, how does stiffness of the collagen matrix play into the DIA-dependent focal adhesion formation? Um, so it was hard to um, address that specifically. I can show one slide if that's okay. Yeah, um, go ahead. <laughs> I have my one slide ready for this question. So um, hopefully if everyone can see this, sorry, it's not that big. So I did, um, there are really easy ways to modulate the mechanical properties of collagen gels. And in this assay, I took the same asini, they were grown up all together actually, and I just split them into um, control collagen that was not bundled or highly bundled collagen. And that had a dramatic effect, as you can see on the response to HGF. Um, we spent a lot of time puzzling about this, but it, in the end, it was not the real focus of the story. But um, other people have published this work. It's a concept that I would never question. Um, so yes, the answer is yes, it does. OK, great. Um, unfortunately, due to time, we're going to go ahead and move on to Laura Macheski. Um, so she can go ahead and start sharing her screen. Um, so Laura Macheski is a professor of cell biology, studying the molecular mechanisms of cell migration and invasion and control by the Rowe family GTPases. So this will actually, these two talks, I don't think we did it on purpose, but they complement each other. Um, her group uses molecular cell biology, advanced imaging and mouse models to elucidate how stresses and signals in the tumor microenvironment, such as matrix, matrix stiffness, uh, lack of nutrients, and gradients of signaling molecules drive metastatic progression. Uh, they also use bioengineering techniques to model the tumor microenvironment to recreate the metastatic niche so that its complexity can be better dissected. Um, Laura, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you, Tim, for your fantastic talk as well and your beautiful slides. Um, so yeah, I'll just quickly say, who I am and where I'm at. So this is Glasgow, me sitting here in Glasgow, which thankfully is not as hot as London today and maybe not as rainy as, as Boston. Um, and I'm, I, my work is funded by Cancer Research UK and the University of Glasgow. And I want to tell you today about a story about uh, forces in cancer and uh, how they couple with energy uh, uh, flux in cells. And this picture is a picture of mitochondria in a cancer cell. And the story is really from Vasilis Papalazaru, who is a PhD student just finishing in my group and uh, just going off to, uh, to look for postdocs. So pancreatic cancer progresses through multiple stages and is uh, well known to be one of the more aggressive and nasty types of cancer uh, with a less than 5% five-year survival rate and very few treatments and not much progress has been made over the years. 
And so it's a cancer of unmet need. And as the diagram here shows the increasing desmoplasia and um, aggressiveness that happens over time in, uh, as, as pancreatic cancer progresses. And so the tissue starts as a normal looking tissue, progressively becomes um, reprogrammed from ACNR cells towards a ductal phenotype, and then abnormality increases over time and accrual of mutations and um, signaling pathways get derailed. And you end up at the end of these stages of PAN-IN, which are neoplasia with the uh, PDAC or PDA, which is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, which is the most common kind of invasive metastatic pancreatic cancer. And so my lab used mouse models to model this process, and we also use uh, cancer cells derived from the mouse models to understand molecular mechanisms behind the invasion and metastasis. And so this picture is taken from this nice review here about pancreatic cancer. And it also shows some features such as increasing hypoxia, pressure in the tumors. Um, and that of course, metabolism is important because the KRAS mutations that occur in pancreatic cancer confer metabolic plasticity and metabolic changes on the cells. And so here's a histology picture of a pancreatic tumor showing uh, abnormal ductal structures, and then the pink is, is uh, showing these collagen fibers which accumulate in tumors over time and fuel the aggressiveness of the tumors as well as causing other problems. And so um, to introduce the kind of idea behind uh, the psilocyst study, the, the epithelium in the pancreas, like any other normal epithelium, starts off as a kind of uh, place where you, the forces are balanced. So cell-cell adhesions and cell matrix adhesions balance those forces and those cells know their identity and their position within the tissue. And then as you have cancer mutations happening, the forces become unbalanced and the cells proliferate and uh, forget how to die and accumulate a disorganized matrix leading to this unbalancing of the forces. And then further progression causes breaching of the basement membrane and also inflammation and uh, recruitment of fibroblasts and reprogramming and increasing abnormality of the tissue as the cancer progresses. And then you can sometimes have metastasis, which can be to sites such as the lung or here shown the liver, where the cells can land now in a soft niche um, which is, um, and, and in some ways, the process kind of starts all over again, and that progresses towards a more um, a large metastasis and increasing fibrosis and abnormality um, continues. And so in order for those cells to be successful, they have to be quite plastic. So they have to be able to go through this transition from an epithelial cell towards a migratory cell and to then go back to a, a soft niche and become, um, you know, it, often small metastases look quite epithelial and then progressively um, get worse again. So plasticity is kind of key for cancer cells and they're always experiencing these varying um, environments of, of different stiffness. And so Bacillus was interested to um, look at how these cancer cells um, here taken from the a mouse model, but we've also used human cells. You can see the cell types down at the bottom of the slide. And um, we, we put them on different uh, hydrogels made of acrylamide with fibronectin for adhesion and asked how changing the stiffness of the hydrogel would change the appearance and migration of the cells. And what the slide shows is that cells on soft matrix grew as small clusters and were rounded in shape whereas cells on increasingly stiffer matrix spread out more. And you don't see a movie here, but they, they're more migratory as well. And those hydrogels that we made, we attempted to mimic the kind of physiological forces of soft tissue like brain all the way up to more rigid tissue like skin. And a tumor would be somewhere in between the medium and the rigid um, stiffness uh, and, and pancreatic cancer is often one of the more stiffer tumors, so it would be more towards the stiff um, uh, stiffness here. 
And you may know about the YAP and TAS transcriptional program, which is one of the cell's mechanoresponsive pathways, whereby it modulates its transcriptional programs and cellular proliferation and other signaling pathways based on adhesion and actin engagement with the extracellular matrix. And so what this pathway entails is that YAP and TAS are transcriptional co-activators that shuttle in and out of the nucleus. And when the cell is engaged, it's actin cytoskeleton on stiff matrix, YAP and TAS are localized in the nucleus and that controls the transcriptional program um, to drive those, those changes. So we asked whether the pancreatic cancer cells have this pathway mapped, and they did. So you can see here cells on the hydrogels from 0.7 uh, up to 38 kilopascals and also on glass. And YAP is in green and daffy blue showing the nuclei. And you can see basically when the cells are on stiff matrix and on glass, they have more nuclear YAP. And there's a quantitation there of that study. So just showing that these cells, even though they're metastatic cancer cells, they can respond to um, soft and stiff and they have an intact YAP and TAS signaling pathway. Now, the other thing we were thinking about is that invasive transformation, so the, 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 the kind of movement out of the tumor and metastasis process requires energy consumption. And one of the, one of the things that consumes energy is the actin cytoskeleton. So you have a cell here with actin in green, tubulin in purple, and you can see that there's a lot of actin dynamics in these cancer cells. And actin, as you know, has a, um, uh, uses nucleotide, uses ATP to keep its polarity. So the, the growing end of the filament, you add ATP subunits and over time it gets hydrolyzed and falls off as ADP. So there's a lot of ATP turnover in actin filaments at the front of cells. So Vasilis wanted to ask, how do PDAC cells meet those energy requirements for invasion and also for matrix remodeling? And I should mention that myosin is another ATPase that's consuming ATP when cells, um, you know, a bit like Tim showed, are grabbing onto the matrix and pulling against the matrix. They're using ATP from their motors. So, where do they get their ATP from? Well, we all know that mitochondria, the cell's powerhouse, are making lots of ATP. And in cells that are invading in 3D matrix, they make these long protrusions when they invade and they wiggle around and stick out their, their protrusions. And we noticed that the mitochondria actually traffic into those protrusions if you label them with mitotracker. So this is a, a movie here of cells invading into matrigel and you can see the mitochondria in yellow with mitotracker. So those actin-based protrusions are loaded with mitochondria. And Vasilis found that if he uncoupled the mitochondria with algomycin, then the progress of cells into um, a wound closure assay overlaid with matrigel, so a kind of invasion assay in a wound healing format, was slowed down dramatically. And so the cells need their mitochondria or need their ATP production in order to make progress. And we were not the only ones to notice this. Um, there was a beautiful paper recently from David Sherwood's lab showing that um, the anchor cell in C. elegans also recruits mitochondria to sites where it breaks through a basement membrane. And this is not in cancer, this is during normal development. So this is a cartoon from their paper um, showing actin branches and the cell, uh, the anchor cell here in, in, in pink, breaking through the basement membrane by recruiting its mitochondria, as well as secreting proteases to break down the basement membrane and using the actin to create a pushing force to break through the basement membrane. And so these cells also need both their mitochondrial machinery and their metalloproteases to create force and breach the basement membrane. And so um, the conclusion from that study was really that the mitochondria were important and they needed to be recruited to sites where the basement membrane was breached, especially if you disabled the proteases. And so our hypothesis going into this project was really that local ATP production by the mitochondria could be important to maintain an ATP gradient that could power invasion of cancer cells. And so we also looked at what happens to the mitochondria on soft versus stiff matrix. And here's an, another few videos showing cells on glass here and cells on 0.7 kilopascal uh, matrix. 
And you can see the mitochondria uh, are more rounded when the cells are on soft matrix. They also get more rounded and more, um, more and smaller when they're on when they're treated with CCCP to uncouple them. And so these are kind of hallmarks of inactive mitochondria, indicating that mitochondria might be more active when the cells are engaging with a stiffer matrix. And there are just some more pictures of that. And then some data showing that the mitochondrial mass um, as measured with mitotracker is less when the cells are on soft matrix and the mitochondrial potential is also a bit less. And this is the control using CCCP on either glass or soft matrix, just to show that we can uncouple the mitochondria and disable them. So given that the mitochondria are um, producing ATP using um, a TCA cycle and also glycolysis, we wanted to know whether the, um, that metabolic flux was changing along with the changes that we saw in the mitochondria. So we teamed up with Oliver Maddox, who is an expert in metabolomics at the um, Institute of Cancer Sciences here in Glasgow. And he helped us to perform a metabolic flux assay where we fed the cells with labeled glucose and you don't need to worry too much about all this M plus one, two through six. What that means is incorporation of the carbon from the label glucose into the various metabolites that he identified using mass spec from the samples. And if we take cells that were on soft matrix versus glass, so looking over here now at the first graph, which says glucose, we see that on soft matrix, the cells accumulate glucose. And as we progress, through the metabolic pathway, which is glycolysis, so the kind of um, glycolytic, non-aerobic, non-mitochondrial pathway, we see that on glass, the cells are having a flux of, um, of glucose through the, um, the first two steps of glycolysis. But then when you go to pyruvate, which is glycolysis that doesn't enter the TCA cycle, the, the cells on soft matrix now accumulate pyruvate and accumulate lactate. And those are kind of like dead ends in terms of, of the TCA cycle. And those are indicating that cells on soft matrix are doing glycolysis and are more glycolytic. While cells on the stiff matrix, you see malate, and that's now an entry to the TCA cycle, and fumarate, oxalogrutarate, cisaconinate, and citrate. And so you see that also you can see by these increasing stacking up of the colors that you have incorporation into further carbons of these, um, of these metabolites that the TCA cycle is more active on glass or on stiff matrix than it is on soft matrix. And so we've got not only mitochondrial morphology changes, but also strong metabolic changes dependent on the mechanosensing of the cells. We further performed some unbiased analysis of what other metabolites that we could identify might be up or down on those matrices. And Vasilis picked out creatinine and creatine as metabolites that were inversely regulated on soft and stiff. And the reason why he was interested in creatine and creatinine was that those are well known to be involved in ATP recycling pathway and whereby phosphocreatine becomes a substrate that can be used by creatine kinases to um, turn ADP back into ATP. And this pathway has been studied for many decades and is known to operate in elongated cells such as sperm cells where you need a lot of ATP that's highly concentrated and a big ratio of ATP over ADP to power enzymes such as ATPases that power motility. And creatine is also well known as a sports supplement and is uh, because it's involved in ATP recycling, it provides muscles with a, an ability to um, sustain and, and power motility and action. So this enzyme, creatine kinase, which is important for turning ADP into ATP, we had a look at that. And in the pancreatic cancer cells, we found that CKB, the, the brain cytoplasmic isoform of creatine kinase, was highly expressed and um, was sensitive to the stiffness of the substrate. So this is a Western blot showing um, cells on the different stiffness substrates 
and then quantification of the amount of CKB expression by those cells. And we saw um, that on glass cells expressed high levels as well as on stiff, and then on softer substrates, the CKB expression level was decreased. So this was telling us that CKB might be one of the factors that's contributing to the higher ATP of uh, higher me metabolic flux and motility on, um, on stiff substrates. So we explored a little bit more the uh, dependence of CKB on mechanosensing. And we found that if we knock down YAP in cells, we also decrease the CKB levels. Or if we took a YAP mutant that was forced into the nucleus by ablating its phosphorylation sites, we also then increase the CKB um, uh, amount in cells. So that's protein levels in cells. And, in, in, and we also saw metabolically that if we put the YAP S5A mutant in cells and forced YAP activation, that we had more phosphocreatine, which is this precursor now to the ATP synthesis on both stiff and um, even more dramatically on soft matrix. And so we, we really thought that this pathway with um, CKB might be very important for what's happening in our baiting cells. So then we went back to the cells and we asked, well, what is the consequence of changing this pathway in our cells for actin dynamics during invasion? So now we've got some movies at the top, a series of four videos showing invasive pseudopods. And in white, you've got Life Act GFP. And then we're going to photo activate. When I start the video, it'll photo activate um, GFP actin. And I'll show you GFP actin at the very tip of the pseudopod. So I'll do that now. And you can see a green flash. And then over time, the green flash disappears as that actin um, turns over and is dynamic at the tip of the pseudopod. And you might notice at the very far end, we've got jazz plaquenolide, which is a stabilizer of actin. And that basically prevents the actin from turning over pretty much for the whole of, of this video, which goes over um, sort of about half a minute or something, a little bit more, maybe a minute. Um, whereas if we treat the cells with cyclocreatine, which is a chemical inhibitor of the uh, phosphocreatine shuttle, so the system by which you make um, ATP from, from phosphocreatine, we see that the actin dynamics is slower, it's kind of intermediate, um, uh, slowed down. And here is a graph just showing that where you have the actin dynamics with just put plaquenolide is basically stopped here at the top, and then cyclocretin is intermediate, and the control is um, without any stabilizer. And so what we think is that this creatine phosphogen shuttle, which allows ATP recycling, is important for the dynamics of actin turnover out in the tips of invading pseudopods um, of pancreatic cancer cells. We also looked at traction forces. So we wanted to know whether cells with, with an impaired phosphocreatine shuttle could still produce force against the matrix. And so in this case, we put cells on an acrylamide gel and we put beads in the gel and we asked whether the cells could deform the gel. And uh, the cells interacting with the gels are shown here and the force maps are shown here. And you can see that the cells treated with cyclocreatine had less ability to produce force against the gel than, this, than the control cells. And there's just some quantification there. And this was also a collaboration with Manuel Salmaron Sanchez, um, who works in Glasgow Engineering Department. So the contractile activity, as well as the actin dynamics, is dependent on the pre-phosphogen system of being able to recycle the ATP. So we then took this into in vitro invasion assays. So these are now a wound healing format where you make a scratch and you overlay with matrigel so that you can watch the cells invading. And if you watch over time, you can see that control cells will close the wound and cyclocreatine will inhibit the cells in increasing concentrations um, from, from moving into the wound space and closing the wound. And there's just a quantification of, uh, of what I showed you. And if we use a CKB knockout, we can have the same effect. So CKB knockouts uh, are impaired in their invasive migration, and you can rescue that by re-expressing CKB back into the cells. We also saw a similar defect in 3D invasion. So these are now spheroids embedded in collagen, treated with cyclocreatine of two different concentrations. 
And you can see the control invading over time. This is now hours. So you've got kind of um, over 70, 80 hours of, of time, whereas the, um, the, the cyclocreatin treated cells are much less invasive. So that's all fine and well, but what happens in vivo? So is this pathway important for pancreatic cancer? And can this pathway actually work uh, in, in terms of powering invasion and metastasis in vivo? So one of the first things we did was to look at some, some um, uh, histology pictures from our mouse model. So this is a mouse model of pancreatic cancer, which has mutant KRAS and mutant P53. And that's driven specifically in the pancreas to drive pancreatic cancer. And that model was developed by Hingarani and Tuvison. And so what you have at the top here is pictures of normal pancreas, and they've been stained with H&E, picocerus red to see collagen, fibronectin, YAP, and CKB. And the brown uh, label is the antibodies in those three, and red in here is the collagen fibers. And you can see that PDAC or pancreatic cancer, which is along the bottom, is much more collagen accumulation. It shows more accumulation of fibronectin than normal. And you also have accumulation of YAP and CKB. So CKB is increasing as um, uh, tumors uh, also accumulate this, this collagen matrix. We also see if we look at a progression series from our model, uh, from normal pancreas to a 10 week old mouse with early pancreatic cancer and a 15 week old mouse with intermediate pancreatic cancer uh, to endpoint, which is about 150 days, that we have an increase in CKB expression over the course of um, the, the, the worsening of the pancreatic cancer or progression of the cancer. And so that indicated to us that this pathway might actually be happening in vivo. So we next did a, 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 we did a model where we transplanted cells into the spleen of the mouse. And the spleen is a good um, uh, model for metastatic seeding of the liver. And so if you put the pancreatic cancer cells into the spleen, they will traffic to the liver and establish metastasis over about two weeks. So we were asking whether the phosphocreatin shuttle is important in transit from the spleen and seeding of the liver. So we use control PDAC cells from our mice, plus uh, mice that were treated with cyclocreatin in their water for uh, during the duration of the two weeks following transplant, or mice which were transplanted with CKB knockout cells. And then we counted the percentage of liver tumor burden by the number of lobes of the liver that, that had tumor involvement. And so you can see some pictures here of the livers and there are little stars on the tumor nodules. There's a nice one so you can see what they look like. And then what we found is that when you knock out CKB or when you use cyclocretin, the liver tumor burden was decreased. Um, and there was a small effect also on the liver weight uh, because of the weight of the actual um, metastatic lesions on the livers. And so the, this pathway is important in vivo for metastatic seeding of the liver. So to summarize uh, that, we, we found that cells on soft matrix were, um, had smaller and more inactive mitochondria and were more glycolytic, whereas when we placed cells on a stiffer matrix, they had an increased elongation of mitochondria, more mitochondrial activity, um, increasing branched actin and actin dynamics that was powered by uh, an increase in CKB and an increase in ATP production and also ATP recycling. And that's linked to nuclear YAP driving up the CKB so we think that fibrotic stiff matrix is promoting some kind of mechanosensing feedback that allows cells to remain highly active and highly migratory when they're sensing stiff matrix. Um, we see increases in adhesion and branched actin on stiff matrix and nuclear YAP, which I mentioned, which causes a change in the transcriptional program. And we've added to the picture this increase in CKB and the creatine phosphate in shuttle as important 
not only uh, for because ATP is needed here, but because, as I mentioned, the ATP to ADP ratio is crucial for how cells, um, how active these enzymes and uh, the actin and the mycin are able to be out in the, the invading pseudopods. Um, and so we think that stiff matrix serves to enhance the ATP production and also the recycling. We're not alone in our interest in uh, the creatine kinases in cancer. So that was a really nice paper that was now almost a year and a half ago by, um, by the, uh, this group here, showing that mitochondrial creatine kinase is phosphorylated uh, by HER2 um, and ABL, and that that's, that phosphorylation causes an upregulation in the, the phosphocretin shuttle driving uh, trastuzumab resistant breast cancer. And so there are other um, creatine kinases that have been implicated in cancer and implicated in producing um, ATP to fuel this um, high level of metabolism that's required in cancer. So we're interested to know how those creatine kinases might work together and also whether CKB might be regulated by phosphorylation. But that's work for the future. Um, if you want to read more about this work, this is uh, where it was recently published. And I have to really thank Oliver Maddox and Manuel Salmon Sanchez, who were the other two PIs helping to supervise uh, this project and really contributing their ideas and, and their hard work as well. And I want to thank Vasilis, the PhD student who did most of the work. Nikki, a postdoc in the lab, was also uh, key for the actin dynamics experiments. And I'll thank all of you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Awesome, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Uh, before we jump into questions from the audience, uh, I wanted to use my uh, moderator privileges. So I was, um, I'm wondering about this sort of switch that we see between the, the stiff and the soft. And um, I was wondering, do you think that it's really a binary kind of thing where you know you have two distinct behaviors or is it really just much more gradual if you were to look at all the intermediate um, stiffnesses? Sure, no, that's a great question. And actually we did look at intermediate stiffnesses but I didn't show that because it's just so busy on the slides. <laughs> but what we see when we look intermediately is that it, it is generally gradual. Okay. So you see like an intermediate response on the, on the kind of medium stiffness matrix. Um, whether some of the things are more of a switch, um, I don't know, but, but yeah, generally it was gradual. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll go ahead and start with the first question from James Butler, who are, has a semi-quantitative question. He says, uh, when we talk about ATP, ADP, we always talk about ATP, ADP with little endpoints where I can compare stoichiometry. Can you please give me something in units of ERGs volume time? Otherwise I'm stuck with compare with control or compare with baseline. Okay, um, I'm not sure we might have to discuss that one after, but I can say that um, what we do have from our mass spec is we, we have some we have some quantitation, so we can get, but we we pretty much can get ratios um, because we always have to compare with a standard. So that may be a question that we could talk about. Um, we could talk about offline, but it is it is true that we can look a bit at absolute levels, but we're never too sure. We don't want to make too much out of that because it's dependent, obviously, on having the exact same number of cells in in the sample and the right extraction buffer ratio to cell ratio and all that. So we tend to talk in ratios. Okay, great. Um, Raphael Petrosan um, says, thank you for uh, an interesting talk. And uh, when there is external force uh, applied on the cell, for example, when pushed with an AFM tip, is the cell um, response or uh, resistant resistance to that, is it passive or are mitochondria moving near the part where the force is applied and then producing more ATP there? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, we haven't tried that and I think it's a great idea. I would really like to try it because it does seem like maybe um, because we found that when the cells push against the matrix or pull against the matrix, they do recruit the mitochondria. So to, to know like the time scale over which they do that and to know how how they would do it to a kind of small prov provoking 
you know, pressure, I think could be super interesting, but we haven't done that. So thanks for the, for the cool idea. Okay, a uh, question from Shashwat on YouTube, who asked, is focal adhesion oxidation also affected uh, with increase in substrate stiffness? And do you think that the expression of genes associated with the Warburg effect and hypoxia also vary in the in vivo condition? Great, another good question. So we didn't also didn't look at focal adhesion oxidation, but I agree that that could very well be relevant. And we did see that the cells were more um, more oxidatively stressed when they were on the soft matrix than on the stiff matrix. So there are changes. Um, we just haven't had time to look into all those changes, but it's a great question and something that would be good for the future. Okay, great. It sounds like you're getting some, some, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really good. It's fantastic. Awesome. Um, Sayali Chadari asks, uh, says great talk. Do mitochondria, and I'm wondering this too, do mitochondria migrate to say, um, sorry, do the mitochondria migrate to the cellular migration front? to locally provide energy. Also, are the mitochondria at the migration front, are they more active? Do you see mitochondria activity gradients within one cell? Another cool question. So we do think they're actively transported to the front of the cell, but we don't actually know the mechanism. So the literature would say that they're transported along microtubules using kinesin, and their retrograde transport is with, with dynein. And so some of so one idea might be that we're inhibiting the retrograde trafficking because um, we do see in our cells that AMP kinase is more active when the cells are invading and they're under stress. And that stress response is known to inhibit the retrograde trafficking, um, even also a mitochondria. There are a couple of other possible mechanisms that we're thinking about, like potentially microtubules can be more acetylated in some of those um, in invasive protrusions um, by another convoluted mechanism where the, the branched act, actin actually sequesters um, histone deacetylases and that will cause the microtubules to become more acetylated because you've sequestered your deacetylase uh, and that might increase the trafficking into the front. So we have some hypothesis, but we haven't, we haven't tested them yet. Um, but there are, there are lots of great uh, possibilities for that. The activity gradients, I would love to know how to do that. So if we could measure the activity of an individual mitochondrion, that would be fantastic. We haven't, we haven't achieved that. And so if, if, um, if that person knows how to do that, then get in touch, please, and let's collaborate. Um, I'm wondering, so I'm, I'm guessing that, you know, in studying cancer, you probably have an eye towards therapeutics and, and treatments. And so I'm wondering if any of these um, processes are at levels that are sort of above physiological, like are they, are they actually pathological in any way that, that could, be, could actually be targeted? Does that make sure. sense? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question as well. And there have been, there are studies, there are kind of old studies in the literature about people thinking about using uh, inhibition like cyclocreatine itself for cancer. And there were some clinical trials, but never it never was taken further in terms of using cyclocreatine as a therapy. There is a window there because the mice were not sick with the cyclocreatine and, and, and it did have an effect. But I, I guess I worry that you wouldn't want to be taking cyclocretin every day um, because it's not very, you know, overall it's, it's depleting your energy. <laughs> so it's, it itself is not, but if we could think of a more specific target, like just CKB or, you know, something that was not inhibiting because cyclocretin inhibits all the cretin kinases um, or maybe a CKB regulatory target. So we've started doing some proteomics pull downs with CKB looking for interacting proteins to see how it's regulated and where it's localized in the cell. Um, because although it's known to be cytoplasmic, there's not much known about its localization. And so I'm hoping that we'll find something about CKB that whereby we could modulate it and then find a window like what you're talking about that it could be useful and you might imagine it being useful for establishment of new metastasis where the cell has to 
kind of ramp up its energy in order to survive after having disseminated. Um, but that's really my hand waving answer, to be honest. No, I mean, that's, that's great. It's just, it's, it's such a hard thing with metastasis, right? Because the cells are just using the same machinery that normal cells are using for migration. Yes, and so yes that's right. That's right. But they have an additional challenge, I guess, because they've landed themselves in a new environment. So it's kind of, can you think of anything about that new environment or their adaptation to it that you could, you know, use as a, as a therapeutic window? And, and if I had the magic answer, I would be, um, you know, <laughs> I'd be laughing, but <laughs> maybe someday. Great. Thank you. I have a sort of related question. So you kind of used a, a, a very large range of stiffnesses going from 700 pascals up to glass. Do you know which, where roughly the in vivo stiffness is likely to lie? I'm guessing somewhere in the kilopascal range, but. Yes, yeah, so as far as the literature is concerned, um, we, we, we think that the pancreas, the normal pancreas is kind of like our softest gel. And the tumor stiffness is somewhere between um the 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 medium and the heart and the and the stiff gel so kind of 10 to 30 kilopascals but those numbers are taken from you know take a tumor slice and do afm on a tumor slice and those tumors are extremely variable in terms of what when you look at a slice you can see areas that have tons of collagen and areas that have not much collagen and so we, we have also tried some AFM ourselves, but we found it difficult because you can't see where you're poking. You get a, a slice that's unlabeled. You don't know where the collagen fibers are or aren't, or even where the tumor necessarily is because it's a pancreas slice. And so it's very hard to get an accurate kind of measurement by AFM. If anyone has, again, ideas, we also thought about ultrasound, which can give you some stiffness, but again, it's relative measurement, and uh, uh, there's uh, I don't know of a nice way to quantify it. I in guess terms in, in, of the real heter numbers. in the heterogeneity of this, because that's quite a big range of stiffnesses within uh, a tumor. So uh, I guess if you had a, a heat map of such, would would you predict that the regions where there is higher stiffness are the regions where they're become, going to be more invasive? Yes, and I would love to be able to do that. So we've talked about whether you could do something like mass spec imaging and image whether there's more ATP around the stiff sites or more of the, you know, um, uh, oxidative phosphorylation metabolites or some kind of way, like you say, of getting the spatial information because we don't have that right now. I think we've got a couple more questions. So one on YouTube from Yabawa Amifa. He says, thanks for the great talk, Professor Mancheski. Would you expect a similar relationship of stiffness and enhancement of ATP production in confined spaces? Hmm. Another interesting one to try, I think. I don't know. I guess confined spaces might also um, suppress the whole yap pathway because you can't generate tension when you're confined. If I remember right, there was a paper from Stephen Weiss's group showing that confinement in collagen, and I, I hope I don't have this wrong, someone can correct me if I do, but I think they showed that confinement prevented you from having nuclear yap and therefore was kind of like a soft environment. And then when the cells could break out of the confinement and generate tension against the matrix that they were sitting in, they could then turn on their yap has pathway. Um, but, but yeah, that's, so it might be the opposite. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Anna Passapera. Um, did you look if AMP-K responds to stiffness as a cellular energy sensor? So we only looked at invading cells and whether the cells in the front, in the front of the invasion chains that were going into the, into the collagen or matrigel had higher, higher uh, AMPK, nuclear AMPK and or phospho AMPK levels. And they did. So we do think that they were under stress and they, but we, but what we didn't do is say, take cells on a, 
deformable matrix that you could stretch or something and ask over a short time scale, could we acutely activate AMPK? That would be nice to be able to do. So we kind of know that the cells that are, are, are under tension have more AMPK activity, but we don't know if it's kind of a long-term slow response or a quick response. A question from Suvan Mukherjee who says, uh, the typical structure of mitochondria that is called Criste because the adjacent ATP synthase comes close and bends in such a way so that the ATP synthesis is more efficient. Does the crowding of adjacent ATP synthase in metastatic cells, is it more compared to what happens in normal mm -hmm. cells? Okay, another cool question. Um, so, I don't know the answer whether it's whether the crowding is different in metastatic cells or not, but I guess you could imagine that it might be changed, um, and it could be something that you know we could look at and test. But I, I have to say I don't I haven't looked, so I, I can't really answer the question. Okay, so um, another person had asked about stiffness, but um, I think I think we've pretty much covered that. So. Um, if there are any more questions, if anyone wants to um, pop in uh, and, and ask. Um, oh, one more popping in on the chat. Um, have you looked at reactive oxygen species levels between soft and stiff matrix and how this could affect invasion and metabolism? So yes, we have looked. Um, and the cells that were on soft matrix had higher reactive oxygen, but we haven't pursued modulating that and asking how it affects invasion. So we think it probably is important and it kind of agreed with the metabolic findings, but we haven't pursued it as a, as a kind of, in a mechanistic way to sort of disable it or, um, or, or, or ramp it up and see how that affects invasion. And that would be quite a cool thing to try so um, Loic has to come back to my lab and do some of those experiments, I think. <laughs> Sorry, he's my former PhD student, so I can tease him. I see, I <laughs> have some uh, ulterior motives there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Great, well, thank you both um, Tim and Laura so much. Those were really uh, unexpectedly complimentary and wonderful talks from, from both of you. Um, and thanks to everybody for being here and we will see all of you guys next week.